So, you know, I love the, this phrase of women of the wardrobe. I mean, when you think about how prominent clothing is as a way that we express ourselves in our lives, um, it's a big deal to figure out how to do that in a way that is also stewarding the well-being of our planet. And the food and fashion industries after coal and gas are the next two largest um, impacts on the planet in terms of pollution and extraction and also human capital extraction. And these are women, Marcy Zeroff, Beth Jensen, Emily Alati, Carol Hsu and Larkin Martin that are changing that conversation and are doing it in really meaningful ways. So I'm very happy to bring to the stage um, these incredible women who will be sharing with us the types of things that they're doing to change literally from the ground onward what's happening in the world of fashion and apparel, <clears throat> and then also how we can engage with that and be part of the change we wanna see. Hi, hi everybody. Um, tough act to follow there. Thank you so much to Tiffany for, uh, you know, sort of setting the, the broader scene of, you know, how we want to show up to be, you know, in this new regenerative space that we're hopefully all, all moving into and leaning into. So let's see if we have everyone. Great. Emily, Carol, Marcy, and Larkin. Yes. All right. We've got everyone. Hi. So we are going to shift a bit more, you know, we'll, we'll certainly, um, be tying in, you know, some of the concepts you just heard, but but a bit more into the practicalities as well. I think of um, what are the challenges um, to becoming a more regenerative, uh, you know, type of of industry. You know, being the apparel, footwear, fashion space. Um, this is really a group of leaders in this space, um, and so hopefully we'll have some good good learnings and a bit of time for for questions and answers at the end of this panel as well. So I just wanted to start um, before we do, um, before we dive in, and I'm going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves in just a minute um, because they'll be able to do a far better job <laughs> than I will. Um, but I just wanted to do a bit of context and framing as well, because I recognize that many of you here on the line may not be as familiar with the apparel and textile and, and footwear industry, I think. The, the conversation around regenerative agriculture really gets, um, has been been led, I would say in many ways by the food sector. And so, um, but the, the apparel and textile space is really, I, I would say coming on strong and really globally. So the organization that I work for, Textile Exchange, which is the global nonprofit focused on supporting um, all actors across the value chain in their uh, driving uptake of more sustainable materials, um, including regenerative, regeneratively grown materials. You know, uh, in that role, we're seeing this really evolve as, as something that's becoming centered and top of mind um, in all regions uh, that we work in, um, that the industry works in across the globe. So um, just for a bit of context and framing, I think, and, and just to build a bit on Tiffany's comments just now, there is um, a report that we, we put out um, authored by my great colleague, Sarah Kelly of Common Threads Consulting. Um, but it was uh, released by Textile Exchange at the end of January. It's called the Regenerative Agriculture Landscape Analysis Report. And the intent of Textile Exchange publishing that report was really to help provide an initial foundational shared reference point for the apparel, footwear, textile sector to help understand some of the nuances, challenges about with regenerative agriculture, the different types of organizations that are in the space, what it is, what it is not, and just really provide that grounding and foundational point of connection that we can now, you know, uh, continue to build off of and have a shared understanding around around some of the 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 ways that that we should be approaching this topic in the industry, so that we don't, you know, fall down some of the the paths that that we've gone down in the past, and in, in terms of things being very black and white, um, you know, and some, some other challenges. So I encourage you to take a look at that report. It was written specifically for the apparel, footwear, textile sector. Um, and, you know, while there, while, you know, and we, we say this very clearly in the report, there is truly no standardized definition of regenerative agriculture, nor do we believe there should be. There are definitely some, some key concepts 
um, that we you know want to want to sort of put forth for the industry. Um, and those are, you know, really an acknowledgement that indigenous and native people have been empl employing this type of mindset to growing food and fiber for, for many centuries. You know, this is not a new concept. And so really making sure that we, you know, particularly in the Western world, are not stepping into this concept of regenerative agriculture and thinking it's something new and sort of co-opting this concept again, as we've done um, with many other things in the past. Um, just ensuring that it's really holistic and place-based and a full systems approach. It's not a one-size-fits-all checklist of practices. Um, and just in general, that it, regenerative agriculture really should be considered a view uh, that works in alignment with natural systems and that really recognizes the, the value and resilience of interconnected and mutually beneficial ecosystems versus a um, an extractive agricultural system, I would say. So this is just sort of the working definition that we put forth for the apparel and textile and footwear sector. I mean, it's already been very helpful just in terms of helping kind of frame, again, the approach that we wanna to take to this topic in the industry. Um, and, and again, I encourage you, encourage you to read the report. We have some really key takeaways in there. Um, I'll just cover off on the five, five key takeaways very quickly. Um, first of all, that a transition to regenerative agriculture is going to really be fundamental for the fashion, apparel, footwear, textile space to achieve our um, environmental targets that we really need to see and have a responsibility to address as an industry. Um, again, to the earlier point, it can't be defined in a single set of practices or a single statement. Uh, it should be really rooted in justice, equity, livelihoods, you know, the communities in which um, farmers and growers are operating really centered around producers like Larkin, who we have on the panel today. Um, the fact that it's really about much more than just, just increasing soil carbon levels. So we're really putting forth this viewpoint to the industry that you cannot or should not be looking at this um, at regenerative agriculture projects as only a way to address um, carbon or the climate crisis. I mean, of course, it, it certainly is um, and can be a lever in that space, but there's also all of these other interdependent co-benefits um, for biodiversity and water and community resilience and livelihoods and all of these other, uh, you know, benefits that we need to make sure we're also capturing and being mindful of as we go forth in the space. And then the last, the fifth and last, um, uh, take, key takeaway from the report is that we really, as an industry, need to move out of silos to speed up this transition. So um, this is where we really focus on talking about food and fiber and food and fiber and bringing that sort of viewpoint into all of our discussions about regenerative agriculture, making sure that policymakers and others are, and this is something that's um, intrinsic to the, the farmers and growers and producers on the ground, but um, not always um, it's not always a perspective that's held once you get over to sort of the brand or retailer level in, in terms of those who are interested in these topics, because of course, you know, our brands are working within a specific industry or a specific sector. And so um, we really need to break down some of those silos between the apparel, footwear, textile sector and the food and fiber sector, and also make it really clear to policymakers that these are interconnected. Um, you know, food and fiber are being grown uh, in the same places using the same production systems and can be mutually beneficial in achieving our shared um, goals around regenerative agriculture and broader benefits that this brings. So I just wanted to start with some grounding there uh, and then just a quick um, sort of reference on, you know, again, for those who may not be familiar with our, with our industry, uh, what material categories, um, where does this show up basically? What are the material categories that we're really looking at when we talk about regenerative agriculture practices? Obviously, cotton is the first one that often comes to mind, um, uh, being a row crop and, and one that, uh, you know, is really ripe for, um, for these practices, but also leather, I would say. So there's a lot of amazing work being done in the industry um, around regenerative grazing and ranching practices um, for the use of, of leather um, in the industry. Wool is another one. So uh, lots of great work being done um, in the wool uh, space and in implementing regenerative practices there. Um, rubber is another one, and it might, might not be one that, that is often considered. Um, and I think Emily, um, who's with us today, may be able to speak a little bit about this as well, both Emily and Carol. But really looking at, you know, even traditional agroforestry practices, you know, rubber is typically um, grown in places um, in, in Southeast Asia, 
And a lot, if there are places, um, and Emily can speak to this too, uh, where they've been practicing, you know, agroforestry for many, many years. And so um, tapping into that, no pun intended, and really building those relationships on the ground, um, those respectful sort of co, you know, mutually beneficial relationships with those types of growers on the ground, identifying those folks um, and really lifting them up for uh, the needs of the natural rubber that's used particularly in the footwear space. Um, hemp is another one that's really up and coming. And I, I know um, Carol and the North Face are really looking at, at hemp and, and hemp can obviously be grown regener regeneratively just as, as cotton and other row crop um, as we might think about that. And then the last one that's also not, not potentially always obvious to those outside the industry is um, re using regenerative agriculture practices to grow the inputs that may um, be used to make what we would call bio-based synthetics. So bio-based alternatives to traditional polyester or nylon or foams that are used in footwear or, um, or there are many other examples of this as well. So all of those sort of synthetic, typically petroleum-based materials, there's a lot of great innovation coming out now. Um, that is looking at how can bio-based materials be used to make those, those, those items instead. And then therefore the next question becomes, well, can those, can those uh, raw materials be grown regeneratively as well? Cause that's obviously, um, obviously the North Star. So I will stop there. Um, hopefully that's a bit of good context and framing as we move into this panel. Um, and, and again, just to introduce myself before we go into the panel, um, my name is Beth Jensen. I'm the director of Climate Plus Strategy at Textile Exchange, which is a global nonprofit organization. Um, we've been around for about 20 years. Uh, originally founded in Texas um, through a partnership between um, Nike and Patagonia and, and several other founding brands at that time, um, really around uh, increasing the uptake of organic cotton at that time. And of course, as the years have gone on, the, the scope of the organization has really expanded to other sustainable materials as well. Um, so my first question to the panelists, um, hopefully you can also all roll in a bit of an introduction first to your, uh, of yourselves. Um, my first question to the panelists, and we'll start with Larkin on this one, is introduce yourself and talk a bit about how you came into the regenerative agriculture space, especially given that all of you, all of you on this panel, um, and really all of us on the, the phone can resonate with this, all of us on the line, I think, um, you're all in roles that are typically male dominated. And so how have you nurtured your uh, instincts in your work and, and how did you sort of come into this space, um, you know, knowing that those kind of barriers have always existed. So Larkin, we'd love to start with you. Well, thank you, Beth. Um, hello, everyone. This is, a, this is a fascinating group. I've listened a little bit to the previous speaker. I was completely intrigued and um, hope that as a farmer, I can bring something helpful to the group today. I, I am an accidental farmer. I am. I became responsible for my family's farming operation in 1990. I was in my late 20s when my father was diagnosed with cancer. He was in his 50s. Um, he battled and lost that three years later. I moved home from Washington, D.C., and where I was had a series of jobs post-college with a liberal arts degree, just talked my way into jobs I didn't have any skills for there. But I am... Um, I inherited a family farm. I'm a seventh generation. I'm an accidental farmer. If I had a brother, I don't think I would be a farmer, but I was the oldest of four girls and the only one available. And so that's how I ended up where I am today. I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. But for 30 years, I've been trying not to drop the ball that I was handed. And so my, um, my responsibilities have been and my, my growing into regenerative practices or our farms moving into regenerative practice have all been business decisions that were practical. I didn't know the term regenerative agriculture until I went to some seminar from a, um, a big ag startup that was trying to, uh, like all startups do, disrupt agriculture in 2019, and they used the term. I've since had to look it up and figure out what it was. And then they, they used the term, it was a, the company was called Indigo Ag. It was a big splashy event in Memphis, Tennessee. And they said, we're, we're gonna promote regenerative agriculture practices. And here are five pillars of regenerative agriculture. It's um, crop rotation, it's cover crops, it's no-till farming, it's intensive soil sampling, and it's um, animal incorpor incorporation of livestock materials. And I was like, wait a minute, we do all that. I must be a regenerative farmer. I didn't know that because principally I'm a commodity crop farmer. We raise 
Um, we're responsible for, for, and this is just in field acres, probably 8,000 acres. It's on 31 different farms, um, rented and owned land, all kinds of share and cash leases. I've, I inherited that, I've maintained it, grown it, more, it's morphed over the years, using a lot of computers, great big machinery, selling everything as commodities. Our crops are historically cotton, but now our majority crops, corn, soybeans, and wheat, we do those in rotation. We've learned, relearned the ancient knowledge that crop rotation helps, that pest complexes are improved because one reset um, pushes or is not a host for a certain soil born. So we've, we've gotten into this from a business point of view. Philosophically, I deeply agree with it. As an observer of life and nature around me, I live on the farm. I love when we used to plow everything um, after a big heavy rain, and I'm in the southeast, I'm in Alabama, so we can get four inches of rain in an hour, or we can have three weeks without rain. It, it, we get 60 inches a year, but it does not come when we order it. It's usually too much or too little, and both of those require soil to be stable and resilient for crops to grow. We have very little irrigation, so all of the principles of, that are now understood to be, or that I understand to be regenerative, um, are are about maintaining and improving soil health, soil resilience, uh, organic matter in your soils, all of which our soils had been damaged by prior practices. So that's that's where we are today. Um, I'm happy, and I'll hope I'll elaborate more on each crop in the mix. But um, and as far as being a woman, you know, it's odd to be a woman farmer. Uh, you know, leaders in the regenerative movement are typically men, because and as farmers, because farmers typically are men. Um, so I haven't, I don't think that being a female is any more unusual and regenerative than it is in just in agriculture in general, although I have seen and am seeing, and I used to joke about, it, I used to be a different gender and 20 years younger than everybody else at the farm meetings, all of a sudden, in, I, and I was the only one my age in the 90s, the farms didn't attract young people back. Um, today, when I go to farm meetings, I'm no longer young, but the younger generation is not quite 50-50 male-female, but there's a significant number of females in the room. Daughters are coming back. Daughters are recognized as a possibility in a way that they were not when I first started in 19. And that's kind of exciting. So I'll quit with that and let the other panelists talk. Fantastic, amazing. Marcy, do you wanna take the next round of that? A brief intro sure. and how you came into it? Sure, hi everybody. Um, so I've actually been on this journey for over 30 years. So I'll kind of break my background into three chapters. Um, the first chapter, so in 1990, I actually co-founded a school that is known today as the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. So I actually started my career on the food side. Today, I think there's almost 175,000 people that are certified as health coaches. And I've always subscribed to Albert Einstein's quote, we can't solve today's problems with the same consciousness that created them. So I've always been in business and I've always leveraged the power of business for transformation. Um, but when I, you know, after running the school for many years, I discovered there really was that missing link in agriculture, as well as in human wellness, which was fiber. And I was exposed to, you know, cotton and other fibers in agriculture. And I was like, wait, how come nobody's talking about this? And I was partnered with the Rodell Institute at the time. And I didn't know a lot about fashion other than the fact that I got best dressed in high school. Um, but I really didn't know the, the difference between a knit and a woven. But I said, wait a minute, this category is huge. How come you know, nobody's addressing it. And, and my mentor was the founder of Aveda. And I was watching what he was doing with Aveda in terms of revolutionizing the personal care industry. Um, we were very close. And I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do in fashion. So in 1995, I coined and trademarked the term eco fashion. And people thought I was crazy that those two worlds were so dichotomous and they would never, you know, they would never coexist. And I was like, well, I'm the kind of person that I want to eat healthy and I want to eat organic, but I also want to dress consciously and I want to be a part of that change or wear the change that we wish to see. So I started a brand called Under the Canopy with this premise that we all live under the canopy of the planet's ecosystem together. 
1995. And fast forward, uh, Under the Canopy launched at many, many retailers, the very first organic textile initiatives um, from Target to Macy's to Bed Bath & Beyond to writing the business plan for Whole Foods to connect food and fiber. So I really, my, my you know, entire 30 year journey has been living at the intersection of food and fiber. So I'm really glad that's one of our topics today. Now, fast forward to chapter two, um, you know, I over, I would say between 2017 and 2019, we call it the pre-COVID years, um, that's when the concept of regenerative really picked up steam. I, um, I joined a small group of people in 2017 in partnership with the Regeneration International, a division of the Organic Consumer Association, and we started a campaign called Care What You Wear. It was the first global campaign that really focused on both organic and regenerative agriculture with, you know, website and a directory and um, really talking about apparel. And, you know, and really for me, what what I was exposed to was, you know, there was this camp of people talking about regenerative and a camp of people talking about organic. And I was trying to figure out, OK, how do we connect these, you know, movements in a more seamless way where they're not, there isn't a divisive element to them because we're all in this together, right? So um, I'll, I'll come back to that, but that's when Celine, you know, started doing her women leading green and, you know, at the epicenter events and talking about, you know, regenerative, the regenerative earth summits and, you know, and seeing this sort of the, the voice that women have in this movement. And really part of it is we're wired, right? To, you know, the soil is the skin of the earth, right? It's so vital to our survival and to our living, breathing ecosystem and interconnected relationship with nature. So, you know, in having sort of all these ahas and then being very proactive with Regeneration International going to their general assemblies in Mexico, and then ultimately um, to the third general assembly with Vanta Nashiba in India um, at her farm, Navdanya, you know, started to really dive into this movement, work with the Rodales, work with Kiss the Ground, work with iPhone, do a lot of education around this. And in 2018, I founded uh, a a farm project in India called RESET, which is an acronym for Regenerate the Environment, Society, and Economy Through Textiles. And what I decided was really to, you know, even though I had been involved in many other farm projects through the years, to really look at RESET as a lever to connect regenerative practices and organic practices and solve for one of our greatest obstacles, which was the transition for farmers to go from conventional into organic. And to you know, look at regenerative methodologies as a way to rebuild soil health and kickstart the process into organic versus start with organic and build on top of it. Because ultimately organic has to be regenerative. It's all, you know, if we're, not building, you know, the, the right uh, methods of soil management in conjunction with weaning farmers off of GMO seeds and chemicals, we're really not looking at this from the light, right lens. You need both, right? So fast forward, um, today I am the founder and CEO of Eco Fashion Corp, which uh, we call ourselves a greenhouse of brands. Uh, we have MetaWare, which is really the, the foundation or the engine of the whole company that helps other brands and companies get to where they want to go in the way of connecting source to story. So connecting the farms, the cotton, the raw materials, all the way to finished product, whether it's women's, men's, kids, baby, home, you know, any kind of textile product. Our model is a platform that actually oversees every single step in a supply chain to get to the finished product, embedding all of the regenerative and organic practices into the model. So in 2019, I started bringing a number of major retailers to our farm project. Um, and doing a lot of speaking on regenerative, including at the textile exchange where Beth works, which I was one of the founding members of back in uh, 2002, 20 years ago. And I think I'm the longest standing board Should member. You mentioned that. I'm so sorry, Marcy. You were in that founding group too. That's right. Yeah, uh, it's been, yeah. A, been a, a long and winding road, but it's really exciting to see see the way, you know, things have taken root on all levels now and, um, and, you know, was involved in the writing of the God standard and, and um, the fair trade textile standard. But today,
today, you know, there's a, a standard called Regen Agra that we're also um, launching, as well as Demeter, which is biodynamic, which really is organic regenerative. And we're going to be launching, which um, I'll speak to you later, the first biodynamic organic regenerative cotton program in the world um, this uh, this summer um, in sheet in a sheet program, and then in the fall with an, a full apparel collection, as well as towels, all um, certified to GOTS and Demeter. So um, it's been, you know, a really uh, fun journey, but, you know, I feel like we're just getting started. Amazing. Okay, um, and Emily and Carol as well. Okay, so <laughs> I have to follow Marcy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, hi everybody, I'm Emily. Um, I manage materials innovation um, for Vans, footwear brand, footwear and apparel, I should say. Um, and my background started in, in textiles. Um, I went to school for material science and textile um, engineering, and which was very much male dominated. I was in manufacturing for about five years before I moved into um, the footwear space and went more on the product side. But, um, you know, it's interesting being a woman in that in that industry versus a man, because you do look at things very differently. Um, so anyway, fast forward, I've been at Vans now, um, but I've been with VF for 18 years, but uh, back in 2019, VF committed to um, regenerative agriculture and all, and all our natural materials. And so um, for Vans, rubber, cotton, leather, um, and we also are doing hemp, those are our four major materials and they're all, you know, come from natural resources. And so bringing regenerative agriculture into um, that work was, um, obviously it was a no brainer because, and that's honestly being uh, in this space for 25 plus years, when I first sort of discovered regenerative agriculture, it actually gave me a new sort of boost around sustainability because for the first time I felt like we could actually make a difference and we could in theory start to reverse climate change. And so um, I think what's lucky for me in working with the other VF brands is because VF Corporation owns several um, many brands, we can all work together and we truly can create ripples and make change. And so, um, so we've been on that regenerative journey now for um, a few years. And what's interesting and sort of when I had this aha moment <laughs> was I had the honor of being part of the Aspen Institute First Movers class of 2020. And I think there's some people on this, um, in this group here who were uh, in my class. Anyway, um, it was that point where I, the, the intersection of people and sustainability, so combining our sustainability initiatives with um, social and racial um, initiatives, so racial justice, putting those together and starting to look at the people part of our supply chain. Um, and that, at that point, we have sort of not shifted, but we have really, created a focus around the people part and going back to the farm level. And so now we have pilots that are um, ongoing with BIPOC and women farmers, um, where our goal is to really change the face of our industry when it comes to, especially in the US, when it comes to cotton and um, hemp. So how can we change that male dominated um, space and bring in BIPOC and women into that. And so we're looking at current farmers and how do we help them move to regenerative agriculture? And then we're also looking at now, how do we go back to academia and sort of bring um, people along and move them right into regenerative farming? Like how do we, how do we create like this modern approach to farming and, and, and bring younger um, women and, and specifically women and BIPOC into that space? And so, that's been a focus um, over the last two years of how do we do that? And so it, it's a very, it's it's complex and it's sticky and it, you know, people get really nervous when we start talking about race, um, but we're, this is what we're trying to solve for. And so listening to Larkin, it's so great to, you know, have a woman farmer here. Um, 
But I think what's unique about my position is I've been in the textile industry for so long. I understand how materials are created and made. And so it's an easy transition to say, okay, now let's bring in the agricultural part of that and women. Um, and the, the one note of being a woman versus a man in this male dominated space is that I feel like I look at the people part of this much differently than a typical man in supply chain or in the textile industry, like where it's all about quality cost, of, quality cost and delivery. You know, you keep hearing those. And for me, I'm like, okay, well, let's talk about the people part of that. And how do we, you know, we always have to tie in the business aspect. And so how do we support the business, but how do we support people? And then ultimately we're solving for people, planet and our products and sort of our long-term uh, procurement of raw materials. Um, so I feel like I have so much to say here, but now I'm getting all this yeah. stuff. Thank but, you. Um, yeah, it's amazing. And I'm just happy to be here. So thank you. Yes, thank you so much. And last but not least, Carol. Hi, everyone. Um, it's Emily, that was amazing. <laughs> uh, I manage global sustainability for the North Face. And um, I've worked in the apparel, uh, sustainable apparel space my whole career. I, my background's in fashion design, uh, fashion textile design. I really wanted to be the next Farrah Wang. <laughs> um, as one of the only Asian designers when I was an undergrad, you know, she was really inspirational to me. And I actually ended up getting really interested in sustainability my senior year of college. And I really credit having strong female um, mentors that were my professors when I was an undergraduate and really guiding me on, on the path to like explore sustainable textiles before there was really much understanding of what that meant. So I did um, a senior thesis project on um, natural dyeing, uh, different types of sustainable textile fibers and have been in the industry ever since. So I worked for a really small organic uh, cotton heavy brand called Stuart Brown right after college in Ventura, California. Um, and then I decided actually similar to Emily, I, I realized that there was a huge social aspect to the apparel industry that um, I just wasn't as experienced in or as aware of. Um, Nicholas Kristoff actually, um, he's a, a New York Times um, writer and author with his wife um, of a book called Half the Sky. That book really inspired me to think about how can the, the apparel industry have an impact, a positive impact on, on women's lives across the world. And so I went back to grad school or I went to grad school, got my MFA at UC Davis and focused on um, working with Indian female artisans who did traditional textile crafts and that was an amazing transformative experience. Um, I graduated, didn't necessarily want to teach, so I had an MFA and didn't know what to do with it. Um, I got back into the, the industry um, working at the North Face and was first introduced to, to um, the regenerative space through Rebecca Burgess at Fiber Shed. And I can't say enough how grateful I am to her for reaching out to us. Uh, we had done a project with her uh, in 2014 called the Backyard um, Project. And we tried to source uh, and make a zip up hoodie within 150 miles of our headquarters, which at the time was in Alameda, California. And we worked with her and Sally Fox and the Sustainable Cotton Project to make this hoodie come to life. And then she reached out to us uh, a year later and said, hey, we're starting up this thing called Climate Beneficial Wool. Are you guys interested? And I was just blown away by the idea of regenerative um, and carbon farming and thinking about how you're not just reducing um, your raw materials impact. You know, generally when we look at products, we think, okay, we have conventional cotton, we could switch to organic cotton. We have um, polyester, we could switch to recycled polyester and that's a footprint reduction. Um, whereas with regenerative farming, you're not just doing less bad, you're doing amazing things for, um, for the soil, for you know, the folks that are stewarding the land. There are just so many positive impacts that you can have just through a brand sourcing more carefully and responsibly. 
Um, so that was our first introduction. We created a collection called the Cali Wool Collection. We had some beanies, scarves, um, and uh, jackets that were um, mostly US made. And ever since we've been um, working across the VF brand, so with Emily and also our other brand, Timberland, on a number of different regenerative projects. Um, so rubber, as Beth mentioned, um, Emily's really working on hemp and leading that, uh, cotton. And the North Face is obviously a very synthetic heavy brand. We make a lot of outerwear, a lot of um, really comfy, cozy down jackets. Um, but where we can, we are really, really focused on converting our natural raw materials to um, regeneratively sourced ones. And I will say, um, just in, in terms of, you know, women and our, our role in the regenerative space, Emily and I were recently in Thailand visiting our agroforestry farmers. And I think something, maybe because of, you know, just society and culturally where women are today, I think we, we have to be bold and we have to be brave. And one of the farmers we met was this woman, Chore Tip. She told us how she acquired her land. So land ownership in Thailand, at least in this province that we were in, is very heavily male focused. It's the land gets passed down from son to son. And if you have land, it's either because you're a man or you married uh, someone who has farmland. So she married uh, into a family with farmland and she wanted to practice agroforestry and her in-laws said, no, that's ridiculous. Why would you ever want to do that? <laughs> so she went out and got her own land, which is not, not a usual thing. She was like, fine, I'm just going to do it myself then and, and purchase this beautiful piece of land, has this amazing, amazing um, forest uh, on her land um, with rubber trees integrated with other medicinal crops, um, local plants, fruit, fruit trees. It's just, it's beautiful. But she had to be quite quite bold and brave and just go against tradition. Amazing, thanks, Carol. Okay, I do wanna get into a couple of, of really interesting questions that we've talked about in preparation for this panel. And the first one of these is really this tension between um, remaining true to the authentic um, idea of regenerative agriculture while also balancing that with the need for scale. Um, and especially for some of these brands uh, like VF um, Corporation. And so I know uh, Larkin, I'd like to start with you on this one and just kind of get your thoughts on how you think about that tension um, and how, how you you know remain true to, to kind of the concept. Um, it's a great question. And um, I wanna make a couple of points uh, in answering it, then they, they are a little bit disjointed, but I think they, they come together uh, to describe the complexity of the question, right? So one of the things that's wonderful about the word regenerative and the definition of, or the lack of definition, of, it's a principle versus a definition. So organic, there, were, there was competition for what does that mean for a long time until finally the, the US government and the EU created a definition so that the marketing departments would quit fighting over it. That hasn't happened, and the, the word sustainable, we all know, is well-intentioned, but marketing departments take it where they want to go for the purposes of the marketing department. Regenerative agriculture is at risk of the same thing, unless, that it is, unless it's understood by the receiver of the messaging that regenerative agriculture can be different in different locations and in different crops and in different regions. So if you're going to dig potatoes, if you're going to grow potatoes, you have to dig them. You can't do that no-till. If you're, I mean, they're just different things. And if you're in an arid region, what enhances soil health is completely different. If you're in an area with overabundant rainfall and drainage is your biggest problem. So um, water runoff is an issue one place. Water retention is an issue another. So I'm, I'm giving you technical farmer answers, but regenerative means you're constantly you're using natural systems. You're using biodiversity as a goal. You're constantly improving soil health with, and, and you're doing what you can in your regions with your crops to minimize input and use them wisely and not having them up. Um, doing that at scale 
is takes a lot of computers for us. It takes a lot of large machines for us. Precision agriculture is really important for us. Um, geospatial stuff. We do a lot of precision work. Another point that I, that's important to make, and there'll be people in this audience, I think, that will disagree with this or, or take issue. One of the most important tools for us to be regenerative, to practice no-till, to use cover crops is GMO seeds because only with them can we reduce pesticides and only with them can we plant a crop into a green cover crop and then terminate that cover crop so that the, the plants then that we want live while we don't plow. Our other tool would be plowing. So our other tool would be degrading the water. I mean, as soon as the, we plow, the soil runs away. Cover crops are wonderfully building organic matter as they degrade, you know, the carbon cycling system happens. We in our region with our humidity and rainfall can only do that today with GMO transgenic crops. So that's, and that's allowed in regenerative. That's actually the most environmentally friendly development that's happened on our farm. We used to spray broad fraction pesticides with airplanes to kill every bug. Now the plants are toxic to the, to the little caterpillars that eat them, but the caterpillars are healthy on all the stuff around them that we're not killing with the, with the airplane. So it's actually increasing biodiversity for us to use. I mean, that, I just wanna make that point because not all audience have heard that from a farmer. Um, there are challenges with the GMOs because as soon as you use chemistry in any system, nature is resilient and nature builds resistance. And we're, and we're finding that I'm not saying it's perfect, but I'm saying it's a, a crucial tool and important. So Beth, back to your, um, your question about scale, I, we, we, do, we are um, heavily enough into regenerative practices that we've been recognized and approached by brands. And the brands say, you know, we'd like to partner with you. And cotton is the, the best one for us because there's identity preservation possibilities in cotton. The commodities that we raise in corn and soybeans and wheat, that's all commingled in the system. But people come to us and say, and this is exciting recently because we've just been selling it on commodity. We, our fiber isn't any different than the people that raise it in a non-regenerative practice. It's no longer or stronger or better. It's just an endorsement of how we are practicing farming that people are starting to recognize and approach us. And for a while, they just wanted to say, you know, can, we be, can you be in our ad for free? We'd like to have that, but no more money. Recently, a couple of brands have come to us and said, you know, we're interested in giving you some small premium per pound. So let's say if cotton sells it 65 cents, now it's $1.20 a pound, but 70, 80 cents, a penny a pound more or two pennies a pound more. That's the kind of offer that's come from the brand. But we're, this, our farm is, you know, farming is decentralized. Farming is splintered across the country. They pick three farms. We could make 3,000 bales of cotton this year or 7,000 bales of cotton this year. Our farm could have high quality cotton or drought stress cotton this year. So if a brand to partner with us, is for a brand to take huge volume and quality risk. We may not raise anything they can use this year. And it's a really difficult link. So brands, it, and the, that's why the muddy middle of, of merchandising has aggregated production from lots of regions. And there's a lot of loss of identity in the middle of the manufacturing cycle around cotton. The, the raw material has to be spun into yarn and that's commingled with lots of growths from around the world in mills. Then it's woven or knitted into fabric that that's yarn could come from multiple sources. There's a lot of middle ground and it's really hard. And I don't think this would be different for other major commodities to go from a, the, the, there are lots of steps between a brand and a farm. And it's possible, but difficult on scale and on identity preservation in, the, in a manufacturing process that is designed to co-mingle. So it's a challenge that I know the brands and, and there are several that we've talked to in some depth and we've got some working contracts with some, we've had to work through it, it's been hard. It's a lot of issues or, and then, for them to have the quantity, if a brand needs 65,000 bales a year for one t-shirt line, you know, and we're going to grow three to 7,000, they're going to have to find more of farms that they want to partner with. And then it's just, you know, it's interesting hard work and, and brands are having to invest, invest in people with knowledge of things they've never had to know about. I bet Carol would agree with that. They've never had to, um, and probably Marcy, farmers are having to answer questions and that's a good thing. I'm the one promoting when we meet. So, by the way, we do all these things on the fields. We plant these cover crops. We minimize fertilizer. We do this. By the way, we also pay full health insurance for our employees. We also do all this other stuff around that most farms don't do. Check that too. 
um, partner with the employer of choice, not only for their practices on their, in their fields, but with their people. So I agree with some of the brands. I'm not sure if I answered your question well, but there's a couple of points I just thought this audience might, might need to hear. No, really, really critical perspective from someone on the ground working on these things, right? And Carol, Carol and or Emily, I think just a question of scale, just really briefly, you know, anything you'd like to, to build on from what Larkin just said would be great. I think to the scale perspective, um, you know, building off of what Larkin said, for at the brand level, it's so important to have those relationships with the, the producers. Um, and that's something that we're trying to get better at. As Larkin said, there are so many middle people in there that traditionally we have not had visibility. So our project with Fibershed was one of the first um, times when we were when we were like supply chain, take this cotton or take this wool. And that is so difficult to do and execute on. And as Larkin said, I've never... I never thought I would know so much about agriculture. I love it. I've learned so much, but I study design. So I'm not a scientist by any means. And it's really has taken all aspects of our brand being more connected to how our raw materials are, are grown. You know, not just me, myself, but also our materials team really needs to understand um, those how those raw materials are sourced to. Um, our supply chain team needs to understand why, why there might be a longer lead time. Cotton's harvested once a year. <laughs> you know, we've got to make commitments so early. Brand is, is like learning how to operate within these regenerative systems. And it is, it is very amazing that that is happening. It's also very, very challenging. Um, so it is slow work, but... Um, we are getting there. Okay, great. Um, next question. And I'm seeing a lot of great questions come in in the chat as well. And so I think we're going to continue to focus in on the questions with the panel here for the rest of the time we have together for another 10 minutes or so. And then we do have a, a discussion for um, immediately after this. So I'm hopeful that we can um, get many of those questions answered in that forum as well. Um, Marcy and Emily, one of the big challenges in our in this work is linking brands to farmers and growers and vice versa. Um, so just curious to get your thoughts on kind of what one or one or two of the real key barriers are and how you've overcome them and specifically how has a feminine mindset helped with that. So just building a little bit off of what Carol said, because, you know, that is very um, typical of a, a major company where they they don't know from being in a cotton field, right? It's, it's you know, in fact, um, when I mentioned in 2019, I brought, you know, a buyer from one of the biggest retailers in America to India, to the farm. She's been buying sweaters for 30 years for this retailer and has never seen raw cotton before. She was almost crying when she was in the field with the farmers. Um, it was so moving for her. So I think, you know, what a lot of people don't realize is a garment can change hands seven to 10 times, sometimes even more in a supply chain, starting with the raw material, the fiber, the cotton, in the case of cotton, then going to a gin, and then from a gin, it goes to spinning, and then it goes to knitting or weaving, then it goes to cutting, sewing, dyeing, printing, finishing, packaging, and so on, right? Shipping. So, you know, one of the greatest challenges is that retailers and brands of any kind of scale, they don't understand the idea that you can actually start at the ground, literally, and build up the supply chain, because the historic model in our industry is start at the factory and the factory builds the supply chain, right? And factories, if you go to them or, you know, for many years, if you would go to them and say, you know, all right, well, we want organic, you know, cotton, what they're going to do is they're going to pick up the phone and they're going to call brokers and the brokers are going to, you know, find it whether they actually find it or not, they're going to find it, right? And then that, you know, obviously leaves everybody vulnerable to potential missteps. So there's a lot of layers in terms of accountability that make it really challenging and complex to source, you know, this kind of model from farm to finished fashion or finished product. So that's frankly why we set up MetaWare was to be a solution provider, like an Intel inside to help navigate this whole process and also join forces with brands and retailers in terms of strategy on the ground so we can help leverage the power of fashion and textiles to accelerate regenerative and organic 
cotton farming, right? So you tell us what kind of products you want to make, and we're going to work all the way back to how much cotton you need, and we're going to manage the whole process. The other challenge that we have found is that there's a funding mechanism missing in that in that situation, right? Where Again, you know, a typical brand or retailer is used to writing a purchase order to a factory and then the process starts. Well, in the case of farming, right, there's about, you know, at least a six month time frame in before a, a typical brand or retailer even writes a PO that you have to account for some kind of cash flow because farmers want to get paid when they harvest. They're not going to wait till you deliver a program, right? So you got to figure out how do we, you know, in our case at Reset, we fund, you know, giving the farmers the seeds, all the training, all the education, you know, as well as how they, you know, build on these methodologies and ultimately the certifications and all the process. And then at the same time, building the product strategies so that we're connecting the dots. And I'll just tell you, you know, I mentioned earlier, we're launching a biodynamic program. That was two years in the making where this particular retailer, I'll just say it's Mercola. Um, and so if you go to Mercola.com, the first phase of our, our partnership was we grew cotton. In fact, in 2017, we launched the uh, a program with them called the Dirt Shirt, where we did a U.S. program from farm to finished product with um, an organization called the Texas Organic Cotton Marketing Co-op right in uh they're in texas obviously and we grew cotton and then took it all the way to finished product to a dirt shirt for them and they invested into this biodynamic program with us but it's been we have 255 dedicated farmers it's been a lot of boots on the ground to get you know to get this going but now that we've kind of worked through pilots with them and some others we you know our solution to this whole thing is partnership and anyone who knows me knows that my favorite number is 11 because one plus one equals 11. We're stronger together than apart. This movement is about collaboration. We have to you know, join forces with farmers directly as Carol and Emily might be doing so you can elevate the farmers and work on your own supply chains or work with companies like MetaWare that can help manage that entire process for you. You know, again, we're stronger together than apart. And that goes back to, you know, being a woman is I mentioned, you know, giving birth and as a mom, right? Hashtag love your mother, especially right now with Mother's Day this weekend and all of us talking about Mother Earth here. You know, we understand how to nurture and how to cultivate a seed that's been planted long before it's born right? How to provide the right nutrients, how to, you know, plan ahead, how to give love to something that doesn't quite, you know, fully exist yet. And I think we're wired intuitively to, you know, especially when it comes to, you know, agriculture, to, to actually focus on, you know, healthy soil, water, ecosystems, and life and that's one of the reasons one of our brands in our greenhouse of brands at Eco Fashion Corp is called Seed to Style, because life starts at the seed. And it's very metaphoric for what this whole movement is about, right? We plant seeds, but they're not just physical seeds. And that's where, you know, for me, you know, planting seeds that are, are clean and starting there and moving up, you know, and bringing that energy all the way to finished product you know, is a part of the model that I think, um, you know, today's consumer look They're you know, they're aware of organic food, they're thinking about, you know, what they're putting in their body. So now we need to, it's not just about making regenerative or sustainability, you know, fashion, we're not about just making fashion sustainable and regenerative, it's about making regeneration and sustainability fashionable by educating consumers about that interconnection, which I know is the next question between food and fiber. We are running out of time. I do want to allow Emily to answer this question as well about connection between brands and farmers and how you've dealt with that at, at Vans. Yeah, I mean, just a little bit to what Marcy said is manufacturing typically it's a you place an order and people don't know what really happens after that, right? So I think our approach was first to internally create awareness around what we're doing around whether um, working with farmers and just regeneration and working with women and BIPOC farmers. And so the easiest way for us to do that was to create a pilot because seeing is believing. And so by having video footage and taking people to the farm and meeting farmers, and we did the same thing, like Carol mentioned with rubber in Thailand and bringing back video um, with us there and showing people in the brand and in and we had somebody from manufacturing go as well. 
like seeing is believing. And once they meet people, you create relationships um, and it just happens sort of organically. And I don't think we would get there otherwise if we didn't actually um, do the work, meaning meet with farmers, create a pilot, work directly with them to procure their, their fiber, et cetera. Um, and so it's creating this, it's education, but it's just creating awareness um, into the brand that eventually will translate into something for our consumers. But so that's how we've started is really by doing pilots um, and then showing people real footage of farmers and um, just creating relationships and having people understand that human side. Um, and I think as a woman, like it, we're more apt to do that um, than a man necessarily, especially in manufacturing. Um, the mindset is very much like you know, quality cost delivery, order time, you know, that sort of thing. So um, yeah, so that's been the approach. Amazing. You know, um, and I know we're supposed to be wrapping up this panel at 1145. So well, I'm giving I, you guys an extra five because okay. we started late, Beth. So perfect. Thank yeah. you. So I'll do one more question then um, for each of the panelists. That would be amazing. So um, I guess I would just say real quickly. Um, and so bearing in mind, we have five minutes. Um, Larkin would love to get your um, brief thoughts on the importance of linking the food and fiber sectors to advance this movement. And then um, any of the others, um, I know there's been a couple of questions around recommendations for consumers who want to align their values um, in terms of purchasing apparel and footwear and just any recommendations you'd have on that. So Larkin, maybe the first question for you. Um, really quickly, the, the food and fiber sectors. So I have an acre or any farmer has an acre. And the principle of regenerative agriculture, at least in our region, is rot crop rotation. So I'm going to graze corn on that one year, wheat and soybeans on one year, and cotton on one year. And that, and that acre is benefited by that rotation. But I'm going to sell my corn to the poultry guy down here, and I'm going to put up, who may or may not be interested in any premium about regen. Hopefully someday they will. But I'm going to the cotton is where we found interest in it, have different markets for the different crops. But the regen acre is the same. The soil is the same. So one of the there's a whole different and emerging, potentially and hopefully, um, economic system called ecosystem services that farms can provide. And if there's value in ecosystem services and carbon markets and all of those things that are beginning to reward continuous practices, no matter what you raise, and if if there's a value system associated with minimizing all the things that regenerative encourages if that's if there's an economic reward to a farm to behave differently that's separate from selling at least some of the products i foresee being a very long time before number two corn is worth more from a regen acre than it is from any other acre there's just no there's no practical marketing identity preservation use for that dollar from the buyer there is in textiles because the consumer cares and that's a, that's the opportunity in textiles so i um the food and fiber link is about the soil being treated well that grows both and maybe we have to find a way to recognize that yeah yeah amazing that's great and then on the consumer recommendation side you know maybe carol and emily first and marcy i'm sure you have some thoughts on that as well I'll just jump in really quickly and say that brands pay attention to consumer demand, right? We can't sell products that, or we not, we're not gonna make products that we can't sell. And so I think it's important as consumers to ask for the, the characteristics and the products that you wanna buy because brands should be listening. If they wanna stay in business, they, they should be paying attention to that. And I, I was just gonna say the same thing, <laughs> so keep going. Yeah, because we do we do actually look at those metrics. And for example, Vans, we've launched our first um, sustainable products called VR3 and we're, we're quickly, we are not quickly, sorry, we are actively looking at clicks on our website. We're looking at a sort of all that data to understand the consumer demand. And so even if you don't purchase, but you're clicking through to learn more, that means something. So I would say, that's probably instead if you're not purchasing to actually we can track you to see if where the interest is so similar to what Carol said. So i'll just add by saying you know, first of all, 
pointing out that women control about 85% of consumer purchasing decisions and probably influence about 95%, right? Um, number two, fashion and clothing is the number one shopping category online. And number three, the millennials have changed the game. And that's one of the biggest uh, markets for purchasing power. They're demanding transparency. So almost intuitively or innately, there is a growing demand for you know, products that are more transparent from farm to finish product. And so you know, I would say read labels, read the brand ethoses, read what they're doing in their supply chains. Um, we have a brand at Eco Fashion Corp called Yes And. I'm wearing this t-shirt that says it's real, climate change, uh, certified organic. Um, and, um, and that brand is at joinyesand.com. And today for all of you watching, listening, um, we're going to give a special 22% off because of, you know, 11, 11, one plus one equals 11. Um, we're all in this together. Uh, and it's at checkout, enter regen22 um, at joinyesand.com. Um, and to wear the change. So there are, you know, lots of great brands out there. Again, read labels um, and, and really from agriculture to popular culture, really look at, you know, and there's technologies now like blockchain and QR code technologies. Um, we have it at Yes And that take you all the way back to the farm that, you know, elevate the farmers, tell the farmer stories and the photos and the videos and the data. We're going to have impact data and ESG metrics coming up our blockchain to our QR code technology that will be available this fall as well. So um, I think we're, we're just at the beginning um, and uh, hopefully all of you will vote with your dollars and um, be a part of the movement on that on the consumer level. Yes, and I think that's probably a great note to end on. So hopefully this has been an instructive panel um, for everyone on the on the line here to hear more about, you know, from some of these real, these true leaders in the space and the apparel and, and textile and, and footwear space on what the what the real challenges are and what the, what kind of shape the movement has been taking in the industry and um, and so, yeah, welcome you to, to join the, the discussion session I'll be leading after this as well to dig in a bit more. But thank you so much to all of our panelists for taking the time today. So appreciate it um, and you being with us today. So thank yeah. you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Emily, Larkin, Marcy, and Carol. And, you know, just to honor, Beth has had a huge role in helping form that paper about what is possible in the regenerative textile space. And it's it's so important. I know this conversation, we could spend a lot more time here. And, um, you know, so much of this is true for every panel we've had. The women on these panels are, are just such profound resources and have depth of knowledge. And it always feels a little bit of a small crime <laughs> to not be able to have more time. Hey, that rhymed. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And